Hi guys, today we're going to look at the story, We're Not Afraid to Die, If We Can All Be Together, by Gordon Cook and Alan East. The story is about survival against all odds, and it's found in Hornbill, textbook in English for Class 11 by CBSC. Let's start with the story, shall we? In July 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan, six, daughter Suzanne, seven, and I set sail from Plymouth, England to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. For the longest time, Mary and I, a 37-year-old businessman, had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer, and for the far past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters. Our boat, Waywalker, a 23-meter, 30-ton, wooden-hulled beauty, had been professionally built, and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find. The first leg of our planned three-year, 105,000-kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. There, before heading east, we took on two crewmen, American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler, to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean. On our second day out of Cape Town, we began to encounter strong gales. For the next few weeks, they blew continuously. Gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming. Up to 15 meters, as high as our main mast. December 25 found us 35,000 kilometers east of Cape Town. Despite atrocious weather, we had a wonderful holiday, complete with a Christmas tree. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather, but we reasoned that it had to change soon. And it did change, for the worse. At dawn on January the 2nd, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots. As the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us, and the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop around the stern. Then we double lashed everything, went through our life draft drill, attached lifelines, donned oilskins and life jackets, and waited. The first indication of impending disaster came up about 6 p.m. with an ominous silence. The wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark. Then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship. With horror, I realized that it was not a cloud but a wave like no other I had ever seen. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest. The roar increased to, the, to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave, and for a moment I thought we might ride over it, but then a tremendous explosion shook the deck. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship. My head smashed into the wheel, and I was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves. I accepted my approaching death, and as I was losing consciousness, I felt quite, quite peaceful. Unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water. A few meters away, Waywalker was near capsizing, her masts almost horizontal. Then a wave hurled her upright. My lifeline jerked taut. I grabbed the guardrails and sailed through the air into Waywalker's main boom. Subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll. My left ribs cracked, my mouth filled up with blood and broken teeth. Somehow I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. Water, water everywhere. I could feel that the ship had water below, but I dared not abandon the wheel to investigate. Suddenly, the front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared. We're sinking, she screamed. The decks are smashed, we're full of water. Take the wheel, I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch. Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen. 
Broken timbers hung at crazy angles. The whole starboard side bulged inwards. Clothes, crockery, charts, tins and toys sloshed about in deep water. I half swam, half crawled into the children's cabin. Are you alright? I asked. Yes, they answered from an upper bunk. But my head hurts a bit, said Sue, pointing to a big bump above her eyes. I had no time to worry about bumped heads. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, I struggled back on deck. With the starboard bash open, we were taking water with each wave that broke over us. If I couldn't make some repairs, we would surely sink. Somehow, I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes. Some water continued to stream below, but most of it was now being deflected over the side. More problems arose when our hand pumps started to block up with the debris floating about the cabins and the electric pump short-circuited. The water level rose threateningly. Back on deck, I found that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard, along with the four stay sail, the jib, the dinghies and the main anchor. Then I remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor. I connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked. The night dragged on with an endless, bitterly cold routine of pumping, steering and working the radio. We were getting no replies to our mayday calls, which was not surprising in this remote corner of the world. Sue's head had swollen alarmingly. She had two enormous black eyes, and now she showed us a deep cut on her left arm. When I asked why she hadn't made more of her injuries before this, she replied, I didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save us all. By morning on January the 3rd, the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take two hours rest in rotation but we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the waterline and on checking I found that nearly all the boat's main frame ribs were smashed down to the keel. In fact, there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few cupboard partitions. We had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit but Waywalker wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach Australia. I checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. One of them, Ile Amsterdam, was a French scientific base. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. But unless the wind and seas abated so we could host sail, our chances would be slim indeed. The great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action. On January the 4th, after 36 hours of continuous pumping, we reached the last few centimeters of water. Now we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in. We could not set any sail on the main mast. Pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damaged section of the hull apart. So we hosted the storm jib and headed for where I thought the two islands were. Mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits and we ate our first meal in almost two days. But our respite was short-lived. At 4 p.m., black clouds began building up behind us. Within the hour, the wind was back to 40 knots and the seas were getting higher. The weather continued to deteriorate throughout the night and by dawn on January 5, our situation was again desperate. When I went in to comfort the children, John asked, Daddy, are we going to die? I tried to assure him that we could make it. But Daddy, he went on, we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together, you and Mummy, Sue and I. I could find no words with which to respond, but I left the children's cabin, determined to fight the sea with everything I had. To protect the weakened starboard side, I decided to heave to, with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves, using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22-litre plastic barrels of paraffin. That evening, Mary and I sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in through the broken planks. We both felt the end was very near. But Waywalker rode out the storm, and by the morning of January 6, 
with the wind easing, I tried to get a reading on the sextant. Back in the chart room, I worked on wind speeds, changes of course, drift and current in an effort to calculate our position. The best I could determine was that we were somewhere in 150,000 kilometers of ocean, looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. While I was thinking, Sue, moving painfully, joined me. The left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits. She gave me a card she had made. On the front, she had drawn caricatures of Mary and me with the words, Here are some funny people. Did they make you laugh? I laughed a lot as well. Inside was a message. Oh, how I love you both. So this card is to say thank you and let's hope for the best. Somehow, we had to make it. I checked and rechecked my calculations. We had lost our main compass and I was using a spare, which had not been corrected for magnetic variation. I made an allowance for this and another estimate of the influence of the westerly currents which flow through this part of the Indian Ocean. About 2 p.m., I went on deck and asked Larry to steer a course of 185 degrees. If we were lucky, I told him, with a conviction I did not feel, he could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. Then, with a heavy heart, I went below, climbed on my bunk and amazingly dozed off. When I woke, it was 6 p.m. and growing dark, I knew we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left, we couldn't hope to beat back into the westerly winds. At that moment, a tousled head appeared by my bunk. Can I have a hug? Jonathan asked. Sue was right behind him. Why am I getting a hug now? I asked. Because you're the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain, my son replied. Not today, John, I'm afraid. Why, you must be, said Sue in a matter-of-fact voice. You found the island. What? I shouted. It's out there in front of us, they chorused, as big as a battleship. I rushed on deck and gazed with relief at the stark outline of Ilya Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation, the most beautiful island in the world. We anchored offshore for the night, and the next morning, all 28 inhabitants of the island cheered as they helped us ashore. With land under my feet again, my thoughts were full of Larry and Herbie, cheerful and optimistic under the direst stress, and of Mary, who stayed at the wheel for all those crucial hours. Most of all, I thought of a seven-year-old girl who did not want us to worry about a head injury, which subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot between skin and skull, and of a six-year-old boy who was not afraid to die. And that's the end of the story. Please support us by subscribing to our channel and liking our videos. All comments are welcome in the comment section below. Until the next story, bye bye for now.